Today, we have a guest who's been on our show before. His name is Dr. Shad Helmstetter. He's the pioneer in field talk, as well as a best-selling author of over 20 books on personal growth and behavioral research to focus on the role of how self-talk is a part of our primary programming and the effects that it has on our neurological pathways. I'm really excited that he's back on the show today talking about his brand new book, Negative Self-Talk and How to Change It. Dr. Shad, welcome back to the podcast. How are you? I'm doing great. Good, good. Well, let's just kind of jump right in, I guess. Um, what, what made you want to write this next book about self-talk? Well, over the, as you mentioned, I've written something over 20 books in the area of self-talk. And I decided it was time to write a book that, that was a shorter book, more concise, and um, just dealt with negative self-talk and, and how to change it. And so I did that, and um, I'm happy to say the book has been really well received. It's, a, it's, a, it's called a 60-minute book, so anybody can read it in about an hour. And that was the whole idea, to, to give as much information as I possibly could in the shortest amount of time. Hold up the book behind you into the video camera for people. That's the book. There it is. Proud of it. It's, it's a good read. I, I've read through it and excited to hear talk to you about it today. Where does our self-talk come from? Our self-talk is our brain's principal method of managing our life. And so it's the job, one of the jobs of the brain to store all of the messages we get, especially, especially the messages we get that are re repeated most often. So those would, the brain would think, those are the most important messages I'm getting. So I need to remember those. So the brain wire, literally wires messages in. It stores them. And that happens from birth on. Um, every single message we get from the moment we're born is recorded in the brain. And then it's recorded short term. And then the messages that are repeated most often, those the brain stores. It wires them in more or less permanently. And the, the real problem is all of these messages we get that create our self-talk and by the way, that self-talk is both what we say out loud and, and what we think silently to ourselves. The problem with most of our self-talk, or a lot of it, is that it's negative. And, and the brain doesn't know the difference, or the part of the brain that stores all of those messages we get, that part of the brain doesn't know the difference between something that's right or wrong or true or false. It just remembers it, and then it acts on the programs that are the strongest. So if we're constantly telling ourselves things like, I can't do this, or I'm no good at that, or this will never work out for, for me, or it's just another one of those days, or I never have enough luck, or all of the kinds of things that we say that we, that we think are harmless, not only are they not harmless, they're very harmful, and our brain thinks they're true and does everything it can to act on them as though they're true. Mm. You know, as I was reading your book, one of the things that really stuck out to me is that fear is also negative self-talk. And for me, you know, I have fear of death. I have anxiety over different things that I'm more and more learning about. What advice would you give to someone who struggles with fear or anxiety on how to change some of those programmings in their mind to overcome that? I think there are, there are a couple of steps that I, would, that I would recommend. The first is it helps to be aware that most of our fear comes from a part of the brain called the amygdala. It's a very small little section of the brain, about in the center of it. Its job is to warn us of, of danger. It's our, it's our alert system. 
And the amygdala was designed to keep us safe from anything that could possibly harm us. Most of the things that harmed people in the past, let's say thousands of years ago, we no longer have them in our lives. So we're not afraid of, of constant fire. We're not afraid of wild animals attacking us and so on. But the amygdala doesn't know that. So it keeps us on alert and it keeps and it's ready for any sound or anything or any piece of information we hear that could work against us. And, and that alerts our system to go on, on notice, to go on watch. And so that's our alert system. It sets us up and we immediately think the worst first and the best last because mm -hmm. you can, you can, when the phone rings during the middle of the night, we don't think the best first. We think, oh no, something's wrong with somebody. They're calling me in the middle of the night. So that's, that's the amygdala that does that. And the amygdala can get out of control. It's, um, we can actually get into the habit of being afraid. And it's good to know that, oh, a lot of that fear I'm sensing is really coming from a part of my brain that's over alerting me. It doesn't really need to work that hard. And you can actually dampen the effect of the amygdala. So that's one thing. If you're aware of that, that can help. The other thing about fear is that anytime you think a thought that is fear-based, that mm -hmm. could be, oh, this is going to happen, or I don't know what to expect, or, or I'm worried about that, it helps, even though it sounds odd when you first do it, is to turn it around and tell yourself the opposite. So when you say, I, I just know something's wrong. It's absolutely fine. And it's okay to say, I'm not sure if everything's right. I suspect it is, but I'm going to check on this. That is, you begin to reframe the messages that were always negative and reframe them into more of a positive light. Doesn't mean you ignore problems, that you overlook things that you need to deal with. In fact, the right kind of self-talk keeps you aware of problems, but it keeps you aware of dealing with them and puts you into action. So when you, when you give yourself positive self-talk, it begins to alert your brain and your system to what you can do instead of what you can't do. So positive self-talk would tell you what you're capable of. And it usually goes far beyond what we even think or believe we're capable of. We're, you and I, everyone watching or listening right now has more quality and more capability than they will ever realize and they'll, than they'll ever put into practice in their lives. We just suspect or we think because we're told so often when we're growing up that we're not good enough or we'll never amount to anything. And, and then we start to tell that to ourselves in, in our own self-talk and, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and we end up not only believing it, but we act on it turning any message around that you get that tells you what won't work, what you cannot do, what you're not good at, um, turning those around is the first real step in changing your self-talk from negative to positive, from being afraid and being inactive to being confident and putting yourself into action. Mm. So how does a person go about recognizing or becoming self-aware enough to understand the patterns that they're thinking, what both negative and positive. Uh, you know, I can I can think to my own life um, of different patterns that tend to show up, but it wasn't until someone told me, "Oh, you have anxiety," and then I started looking at, "Well, okay, if I have an anxiety, what's triggering it?" And then I started paying more attention. How do, how do I become more self-aware? Super mindfulness. Mindfulness is a habit. Uh, mindfulness is becoming very popular nowadays because of meditation and so on. And mindfulness is, is being aware of everything you're saying, everything you're thinking, and then also on what's going around, uh, what's going on around you, what's going on in your life. But the most important part of this kind of mindfulness is to listen to yourself. And that's a habit. And most of us aren't in the habit of, of kind of analyzing what we're saying. We're certainly not in the habit of, of looking too closely at what we're thinking. 
And so we get used to the idea that thoughts just kind of drift through. They go in and out and we think they, that they don't really count. Every single one of those thoughts actually counts. You can become aware of that by monitoring your own self-talk. That means to monitor everything you say and monitor even what you think. And even though it takes a while to get into that habit, once you get into it, you become aware and you find yourself hearing what you're saying. You find yourself aware of what you're thinking. And, and in the moment that you start to say, oh, this would never work for me, or I'm no good at that, or, or I'll never amount to anything, or, or today's gonna be another one of those days. It's gonna be, an, a, it's gonna be a, another blue Monday. The moment you start to think the negative, turn it around. Mm. Say the opposite. The first time you say it, it may not be true, but that's just because your old programs have gotten you to believe the negative about you. In time, with some practice, the new self-talk takes the place of the old self-talk. That becomes true. And you actually are good at remembering names. You actually are confident. You actually are qualified and capable. You're ready to take action. You can do this and you know you can. That kind of an attitude comes from turning your self-talk into stating the new truth about you. That new truth is actually the you, the you that you were born to be in the first place. You're just getting it right. Where does the idea of self-talk begin then? The idea of, of self-talk starts with becoming aware that we are carrying on a dialogue with ourselves all the time. And, and then recognizing that that dialogue is not some group of innocent thoughts. That dialogue is actually our brain doing its best to manage everything that's going on in our mind and everything that's going on in our life. But self-talk starts with recognizing that, there's, that, that our brain is communicating with us and it's asking us for direction. Hmm. I never thought of it that way. So I'm really curious what you have to say about, about this because there's people in all different walks of life. Some have better mindsets than others, and you can see the difference in people's lives. When I look at people who tend to be more negative, uh, critical, they live a certain way. They have less success than some of the people that I know that are very positive and speak positive affirmation, so to say. So over a long or a prolonged period of time, what are some of the effects mentally, emotionally, through success that negative self-talk does to our environment and to our mind? Like, What are the impacts of negative self-talk? Well, negative self-talk is self-talk that is harmful or can hurt us or is untrue about us or sends us in the wrong direction, gets us to take the wrong action. Works like this. Our self-talk creates our attitude. Our attitude creates our feelings. Our our Feelings and our attitude create our actions and our actions create our results. And the results of negative self-talk are things that happen in our lives, happen because of something we believed incorrectly or something that caused us to take the wrong action. Hmm. And you can, you can literally think of anything that, that happens in your day from, from the moment you wake up in the morning until you go to bed that night Every single step you take, every single thing you say is based on beliefs that you have about yourself. And negative self-talk is that part of us that doubts your qualities, doubts your capabilities, and sort of gives in to average or gives in to what won't work as opposed to what will work. I think to make that clearer, It's 
perhaps the best example is to look at your brain like it's a it's a super chemical biological computer and it has to be programmed and however your brain is programmed that's that's what's going to create your actions that's what's mm -hmm. going to create what what you do in any given day that's going to create what you think about it would be like if you were flying on an airplane and you wanted to fly north but by accident you programmed the computer on this the onboard computer on the airplane to fly south so even though you desperately wanted to fly north that plane is going to fly south even if it's the wrong direction if you've given programs to your brain if you've given commands to your brain which which we do every day through repetition when you program your brain if you program it with the wrong messages it will follow those messages because it thinks that's the way you want to go even if you wanted to go north and it's taking you south so so negative self talk is really recognizing or negative self talk is 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 when we've programmed our brain to do the wrong thing or to believe the wrong thing or the, to think the wrong thing. I may have mentioned earlier and, or in other times that the, the part of the brain that stores all of the messages we've been giving it, all of those programs we've been creating, that part of the brain doesn't know the difference between something that's true or false. So it simply acts on the programs it gets most often. Mm. The problem is, there are no classes in school, or very few, in any school um, on how we should program ourselves. We learn how to program computers. Even now, young kids are learning that. But they're not quite yet ready to learn how to program themselves. And, and I think it's time that we, I taught my kids that when they were very young. I've seen children now literally grow up to become amazing, phenomenal people, growing into that form that they were born to be in the first place, because a parent took the time to teach them how to get the right programs. It's something anyone can do. It's natural. It's how the brain is designed to work. What I write about and what I teach is how to do that in the most practical, easiest way so that you can actually do it. Right. You know, the, the reason why I asked what are some of the effects of negative self-talk because, you know, since you and I last talked on the podcast, um, you know, I've been on this journey of self-discovery around self-talk and, you know, with talking to you and Dr. Benjamin Hardy, I realized that I had some pretty weird negative programming. And I don't know if you remember this, but last time we talked, I was probably a lot bigger. I've actually lost like 30 pounds since you and I last talked. And we Congratulations. talked about- Congratulations. Thank you. And we talked about how even that was programming. And- I lost quite a bit of weight fairly quick this year and it scared me and I thought something might be wrong. And so I went to the doctor, I did blood tests, urine tests, all these other tests, uh, stress test, psyche valve, and, you know, came up with, I need to lower my cholesterol, but also that I am suffering from a, um, how'd they call it, mild depression. And that shocked me because I'm not someone who's doom and gloom on life. I'm fairly optimistic. I set goals. You know, I believe goals are attainable. You know, so my idea of what depression was, was actually not, I mean, depression was from what I saw based off of movies, but there's a lot of other forms of depression that I didn't even know. And so immediately they're like, okay, well, you know, since you have depression and obviously this is causing some anxiety issues, let me just write you a prescription. And I'm like, well, hold on. I, I don't want a prescription. I don't think this is chemical. I don't think this is genetic. I think that I just need to retrain my mind. And he's like, okay, but if you ever want to come back and get a prescription, just let me know. And so I've been on this journey ever since that, which were like, was like a few months ago, 
to to really focus on reprogramming my mind based off of the things I've learned from you. And I even started seeing a therapist to help with some of that as well. Because uh, I think you're the one of the first people that told me about cognitive behavioral therapy. And so I say all that to say, I, I've noticed it affected my life. I noticed that I wasn't as high performing as I wanted to be. And do you mean that, that the that the depression was keeping you from performing the way you wanted? Correct. Yeah. And the anxiety, the fear of death, the fear of poor health, um, you know, not being able to enjoy, you know, driving out of the city. Can I? Yes. But do I like to? No. Anytime there's a fun event, I'll get excited and then I'll get anxious and then I'll make myself sick you know, all these things were happening. And, you know, our last conversation really helped get me thinking about all this and getting my life on the right track. So I guess I brought up all that is because I think so oftentimes we try to, or we're told to medicate ourselves over actually going through a healing process. Just try to medicate the problem, but not come up with a solution. And so, I don't know. I, I'm going somewhere with this, but I, I lost my train of thought for a second. But you know me. What, 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 are, what are your thoughts on basically everything I just said? All right. I'll, I'll respond to that. Um, I'm not a clinical psychologist, so I won't respond in that tone. But I'll, I'll share with you what I've discovered about what you're talking about. It's at least an easy way to look at it, a helpful way to look at it. If you see depression as fear of the past and anxiety as fear of the future, then that immediately gives you, or that suggests that there are a couple of things you can do. One is to recognize that you're here and you made it through this far. And that much of what happens in our past is, without a doubt, preparation for today and what we're going to do in the future. And that isn't always easy. And it's filled with a lot of rough spots, sometimes terrifying events and, and difficult parts of our lives that we overcome or we get through or we get past them and then we're stronger and then we're more prepared for the next day and for tomorrow and the future. Letting go of that, I'll put it another way, holding on to that is a habit. Mm. So is letting go of that, a habit. It's done. Those are classes in school that we've already gone through. We might as well get past those and take what we learned from them, apply it in our lives, but let's move forward. Then that introduces the opportunity for anxiety because because tomorrow is an unknown and we don't know what's coming. And the best thing I've ever found to do about that kind of anxiety is to find a future event that you're creating and that you're planning for. A future moment, a future accomplishment, a future goal that you're going to reach. And focus on that event. There's a very good chance that putting one foot in front of the other, you're going to get there. But when you focus on the achievement of that event, your brain is now busy. It's occupied doing something that's healthy. That is, it's looking at something in the future that you're working at creating. And while it's doing that, it's going to spend less of its chemical time worrying about getting there. And the anxiety goes down. I recommend you try that because it's something that anyone can do and, and all it requires is you choosing an event or a moment or a time or something special that you're creating, that you're going to create, that's going to happen in your future, that's really good to look at. So this is something that's very positive. This is something that, that you really want in your life. This is something that, that makes you feel good just thinking about it. And then Take your anxiety time and replace it with visual time, focusing on that future event, and watch what happens. 
I will absolutely do that. So I've had the luxury of, of going through your book. What, what would you explain the job of neuroplasticity is in our brain? First off, I think it's a miracle. In fact, it is. Neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to constantly rewire itself based on new input. And although we used to believe years ago that the brain stopped changing and stopped growing very early in our lives, we've now learned that that's not the case. The brain continues to grow. It continues to wire new neural networks based on new information that it's receiving. That's neuroplasticity. What's exciting about that is you get to do something about that. That is, you're in control of the new perceptions your brain is going to get. You're in control of, of the messages that are going to be fed to your brain. You're in control of the programs that you're going to type into your brain's, into your onboard computer brain. You get to do that. And what that means is, because of neuroplasticity, you get to change and you get to change in a way that you want to change. And that's where, that's where growth comes from. That's where our experiences, combined with a positive attitude, literally wire your brain to do more of the same. So give me an example here. So with the Whole Person podcast, it's faith, family, finances, friendship, fitness, and fun. And there's this concept that I'm, I'm working on in my own life, which is the whole person being whole in all these areas, living in a way that I'm not bankrupting one and realizing how every one of those areas affects the other. So if I'm wanting to, to learn about faith more and be more devoted to that area or family finances, when I go about setting to want to change the way I think in that area, what are some of the best principles, some of the best examples, uh, jobs, tasks that I can do to help make that become a reality? Well, the first thing I would recommend is the self-talk that says, I balance my thinking in all things that are important to me. My thinking is clear, organized, and balanced. That's excellent self-talk because that's the kind of self-talk that sets up the rest of your thinking to always have the right emphasis, the right amount of attention given to each of those areas that are important to you and that you're working on. When you do that, when you have, when you have self-talk that says, I think in a balanced way, I balance the importance of all of the things in my life that are, that are important to me, then, then your brain says, okay, I'm going to help you do that. So that gets rid of having to worry about overshooting in one area or spending too much time in one area to the lack of another area. So I would start there. Mm, that's really, really good. If our self-talk is a byproduct of our subconscious, how do we change it? Consciously. <laughs> I love it. So, so you're absolutely right. And that's a very good point. Perhaps... It's, it's less than 10% of our programs that we're even aware of, that we have any idea what they are. 90% or more of our programs are completely hidden, are completely buried. There's a reason for that. The brain can't possibly be focusing on every program it has because we'd never get anything done and we wouldn't be sane. So the brain has to do a lot of things on autopilot. And that's what the subconscious mind does really well. It, it stores programs that are giving us directions and giving us information about how to deal with each day of life, but it's doing it on autopilot, so we don't have to think about it. Unfortunately, 
it's been estimated that as much as 77% of all of our programs are negative or counterproductive or work against us. And what that means is, here are, the, here are these two numbers, that about 90% of our programs are hidden from us and 70 or 80% of those programs are the wrong programs. <laughs> oh, man. And that, that's actually why we have so many problems in life. That's why we make things difficult when they wouldn't have to be. That's why we struggle as we do, because we're actually following in the footsteps the, the directions of old programs that are leading us in the wrong direction. So your, your question there is, how do you get rid of those programs? And I would add, how do you get rid of them if you don't know what they are? Ooh. Fortunately, the brain has a process it's a physiological, a biochemical process that works for us in this regard. Any program that isn't being used long enough for a long enough period of time, the brain realizes it is no longer necessary and it, it will get rid of it. Uh, the, the scientific term in neuroscience is pruning, just like prun pruning a rose bush. The brain will get rid of programs you're no longer using. So how do you get it to stop using those old programs that are working against you? You give the brain new programs that are the right programs that you want it to follow. Programs that tell you what you can do, what you are capable of, what your focus is, how you deal with problems, how you overcome them. You give yourself a constant series of messages, that's practicing positive self-talk, and through that positive self-talk, you begin to wire with repetition. You begin to wire those new programs into your brain. With repetition, your brain will listen to them and think, oh, that must be important. It's being repeated often. So, so I got to keep that one. So now it, now it wires that in, in, in its complex neural circuit, circuitry. And in order to wire that in, it's going to have to get rid of other programs it's no longer using. So by doing that, what you're doing is you're replacing old, negative, worn out, harmful programs with new, positive, helpful programs, and you're doing it consciously. You're doing it by thinking about it. You're doing it through repetition. You're doing it by mindfulness of constantly, we talked earlier about being aware of, of, of your self-talk and what it is. That's why it's important to be aware of it because you have every day this incredi incredible miracle of an opportunity to be able to give yourself brand new, healthy, enlightening, positive programs that are going to help you go where you really wanted to go in the first place. So what are some, so earlier we asked for examples of what negative self-talk looks like, the outcomes of it. For someone who has positive self-talk, what are some of the results a person could expect to see in their life, in their, say, in their faith, family, finances, friendship, fitness, or fun? What are some of those results? Like, if you do this, you could probably see some of these. You, you observe when you watch somebody who's a positive self-talker, who's been doing it for a while, you observe the results. And it's the results you're talking about. What you see almost always, invariably, you see that person getting, getting more organized. You see that person wasting less time. Doesn't mean they don't get plenty of ex uh, uh, rest after exercise, but they do. You see that person getting in proper, into correct balance. You see that person being stronger in their faith. You see that person getting healthier. You see that person clearly resolving and improving relationships, their relationships with others and their relationship with themselves. You are able to see that person become happier. Their attitude becomes more lifted because now it's dealing with what can work instead of fighting what cannot work. And you watch a process of that person's life coming together. 
changing, lifting up, becoming the person that they were very likely born to be in the first place, but through old programming had probably gotten off track along the way. Not through their own fault, just we get programmed by our parents and the world around us and then our own self-talk and, and a lot of that's the wrong kind of programming. So it takes us off the path that we could have been on had we, had we been born and immediately set about becoming that amazing, incredible, unlimited human being that we were designed to be in the first place. No one is designed to fail. We're, every single individual is designed to mm. succeed, to, to excel. The, the motivational speakers are absolutely correct about that. But, but we get off track through bad programs. And when you watch someone who is changing their self-talk, which means they're actively, consciously working at changing their programs, you're watching a person who's getting back on track to become that unlimited individual that they were born to be in the first place. It's a beautiful thing to watch. It's a beautiful thing to experience. So as you're sharing this, you know, I'm looking at my life in multiple lenses. From what we talked from last year, I've seen a lot of changes, a lot of positive changes. And like, hey, this, okay, I'm seeing these results. These are working. And I'm also seeing, all right, there are some changes that still are left to be made, changes that need to continue. So in this whole process of change, in the whole process of positive self-talk and weeding out the negative self-talk, where is God's, where's God in this process? Where's God in the mix? How, what's his role? Nothing complicated about that question. <laughs> well, it's based on the individual spiritual beliefs if they have spiritual beliefs. And it's, it's very, I suppose if there's a, a unifying thread among people who believe in God, that, that God is the essential, among many other things, the essential energy that drives all of us. And that essential energy is, to, is perceived to be a perfect energy. And I would suspect that one good way to look at your feeling about spirituality or divinity is how closely you can align yourself with that perfect divinity. Doesn't mean that you try to be perfect. It means you do everything you can to get better and better and better. And that aligns perfectly with what appears to be how we were designed in the first place. And that is to get better and better and better. So everything we're talking about today is part of the process of doing that. And it fits perfectly, in my mind, with the deepest, strongest spiritual thoughts and beliefs. Mm, that is good. What are some other things from your book that we haven't talked about that you want to bring up? I think the most not the most difficult challenge, but the most common challenge that I've witnessed, that I've seen in people over the years, and this is my 40 something, just over 40 years of working with this subject and watching people use self-talk to improve their lives, literally change their lives. The number one challenge appears to be putting it off for another time. Mm. It's that old habit. And the reason we don't get out of the habit is because it is the habit and it's the stronger habit. That habit of putting it off is actually made up of thousands of those programs that are negative programs that are buried in our subconscious mind. So if, if, you, if you decide you want to get better, if you want to change your self-talk, Recognizing that anyone who wants to change their self-talk can do so. If you want to get better, it gets down to a, a decision to, 
take a first step, to take a step. That step could be anything as long as it precedes, if, as long as it sets up a second step and a third step. For instance, examine your talk all day today. That's a good first step. Exa think about your self-talk. Be really mindful. Listen to every single thing you think today. And then agree to that. That's something you could do. That's something anyone listening could do. And then you could do that again tomorrow. Listen to everything you say. If you do that in two days, you can do it a third day. If you kept doing that for less than a month, you would, have, you would establish a new habit. You would wire a new habit into your brain that, that gets you to, to become, that gets you to listen to yourself. The second habit to create after that is to begin to change any negative self-talk you have that's harmful or works against you. Turn it around, flip it, say the opposite. It won't sound like you're telling the truth at the moment, but you are telling the truth. You're actually setting the record straight. You're going back to how you were born to be in the first place. You're just setting that record straight. Just doing those two things. One, listening to everything you say. Everything. Everything you think throughout the day. You can do that for a day, and then another day, and another day. And then, begin to change every single negative thought you have into something that works for you instead of working against you. Why would we ever take the computer keyboard that we have strapped to our chest, that's wired right into our brain, why would we ever type something into it that says, I'm so stupid, or I'm not good enough, or that will never work for me, or, or I can't lose weight, or I can never remember names. Why would we ever do anything like that that we know is harmful, could stop us, or is holding us back? Turn all of them around. Once that habit starts, life begins to change in the most miraculous, wonderful way. And it's all practical. It's all real. None of this is just hopeful self-motivation. This is real. This is how the brain works. This is how it got wired in the first place accidentally. Now we get to take control over that. And with some simple habits that we can do, that we can practice having, that we can wire into our own brains, we can literally begin to take control over the wiring of our future. Mm. That is good. And it's real. We can do that. Ask me a question. What would you like to do most? I want to be a speaker. Uh, both practically growth, personal growth, and, and in ministry. I want to okay, travel you can do and that. speak. You can do that. Next. I want to be an author. You can do that. I have a question then. Do either of those goals, those objectives, seem difficult? Yes. Do you know the magic word there? Seem? Seem. They're an illusion. We have to take about the same number of breaths every day, and we have to do that, and we're going to. We also have to, if we're going to get anywhere, we have to take some steps. We get up, we walk, we move around. We have to take certain actions. You might as well be taking those breaths and those steps and those actions based on something you want to accomplish. And the more clearly you give the picture of, of what you want to accomplish to your brain, the more it will begin to rewire itself to help you get there. And in fact, in not too long a time, it's very hard to stop. It's very hard to quit because your brain has said, wait a minute, you said we're flying north. And you got your wiring right this time, and we're flying north. You're going to be a speaker. Wait a minute. You said you wanted to write. We're flying the plane in that direction this time. We're going to get it right for you. You've been setting it up. You're going to be a writer. Then going to be becomes replaced with is. You are. You're doing it. 
and 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 it is no more difficult than breathing and walking and doing something else. So the people who tell you it's really hard to be a a, a major international speaker, or they say, oh, that's that's so hard to do. It's not many people can do that well. Uh, that's just not true. That's an old program. That that's their program. It's not yours. Mm. It's not that difficult. It's it's making the choice, getting rid of the old negative self-talk, the old programs that got in your way, creating new positive self-talk that gives new directions to your personal onboard computer, and then get out of its way because it's going to do it. Hmm. So another one would be, I want to have a chartable podcast, one that's in the top charts throughout podcasts. You can do that. That involves one, two, three, I think three steps. One, learning everything you possibly, everything there is to know about having a charitable podcast. Two, making the choice to do that, look at the cost. I don't mean the financial cost. I mean the, the resource cost, your time, your energy, your space. Three, begin to set yourself up as that individual in your mind in advance. Begin to be that person doing that. So I guess there's a fourth that, that anyone who wants to achieve anything has to follow, and that is what are the action steps? What are the steps? Everything gets down to steps. What are the steps it takes? If you give me some in, an individual, you present me with an, somebody. Let's say it's a it's a young person. I'm going to I'm going to say someone very young, 18, 19 years old, who wants to be a world famous speaker. And let's say they don't have any they don't have an education that would automatically make it easy for them to be a speaker, but they have an un dying goal to do it. They have an unstoppable belief that they can do it. I would vote for that young person to achieve that goal long before I would vote for the person who is 30 or 40 years old, has a lot of experience, perhaps a grand education, and um, might like to do that. And uh, when they get around to it, um, they, don't, they also want to be a, a world famous speaker. I'll vote for the young person who has the dream, the belief, and the goal long before I'll vote for the person who is putting it off for some other time. Mm. That's good. It, it's amazing how many things are possible. And, and even in saying that, I, I, caution, I caution anyone listening from thinking, well, that's, that sounds motivational. No, it's not motivational. It's neuroscience. It's, it's how the brain works. If we give it the right instructions and we learn how to do that, and it's not difficult, and then we, and then we give our, our brain the right messages, it will do anything that is possible that we want it to do. Anything that's possible, our brain will do for us. That isn't some motivational theory. That is science. That's how the brain is wired to to keep us alive. That's how the brain is wired to make us move forward into life. That's this incredible miracle that we've been given. And maybe we lost the instruction manual along the way, mm -hmm. if there ever was one. But we're learning a lot about how to do that. Anyone who wants to reach their goals, as long as those goals are, are reachable. So we're always realistic. But take off some of the limits. Any goal you want to reach, if it's practical, if it's something that can be done, and if you want to do it strongly enough, you can do it. it. Depends on how your brain is wired. Change the wiring of your brain, you will change your life. Plug, plug what you're currently doing, where you can buy the book, or your series of books that are coming out. Well, you can get the book, Negative Self-Talk and How to Change It, on Amazon. And I'm very proud to, 
to uh, promote that book because I really like it. I've read it. I highly recommend it. Um, I also recommend that if you want some help getting started changing your self-talk and staying with it, um, go to the, the Self-Talk Institute. It has a wonderful website. It's called selftalkplus.com. So it's S-E-L-F-T-A-L-K-P-L-U-S. Dot com, selftalkplus.com. And that is a, a service of the Self Talk Institute that allows you to stream self talk on a broad variety of subjects, um, audio recordings of self talk directly to your phone or any listening device. And you can, two things to remember you can stream it free for 30 days. It's a subscription service, but it's free for 30 days. So there's no reason not to try this. Start listening to self-talk. Listen to some about 15 minutes every day and watch what happens. And also, if you would love to continue after that and you just feel that you can't afford it financially, the Self-Talk Institute turns nobody away. They will make it possible for you to be able to listen to self-talk. So again, there's no reason not to. So if you'd like to change your self-talk, and the easiest way we've ever learned to change it is just like learning a new language by listening to it, then go to Self Talk Plus and give it a try. I think you'll like it. Awesome. Dr. Shad, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast again today. Thoroughly enjoyed everything I've learned. Just you as a person are enjoyable to talk to, and your wisdom and knowledge and understanding in this field are are so life-giving to the implication of what you're talking about. So thank you so very much for coming on. Thank you. And I hope you have an incredible day. I will. You too.